So, um, yeah, I'm Dan West. I work at the Department of Health. I'm the Chief Digital Information Officer. Before I make a start, um, I just wanted to make a, a slight adjustment to the title of my session, which is set out in your agendas today as Digital Transformation for Resilience uh, and Better Healthcare. Um, I'd like to insert and social before the word care. Uh, it's important for us all to remember that Northern Ireland is unique in the UK and that our health and social care sectors are fully integrated and have always been so. Uh, and that is a, I'm sure you'll all agree, a, a very good thing. In preparing for today's session, I reflected back on the three main topics that I'd presented at the conference on the 12th of November last year. Uh, I walked through the, the structures within health and care that can make digital transformation quite complex. I'd set out the simplified view of 10 strategic priorities around digital in health and social care. Uh, and a bit of a view on how they'd been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and I talked through the COVID digital response, thinking about the system-wide IT and data requirements, as well as the seven new digital products and services that we had put in place to support citizens during the pandemic. I then started to think about what you lovely people would want to hear about this year, and had considered doing something of an update on the, the COVID digital products. We now have 10 product groups delivering new services, including uh, the most recently launched, which is the COVID certification service for international travel that we'd worked on with our friends uh, in the NI civil service digital gang. Um, uh, and actually James, uh, who I think is on stage, um, led the testing for it. So uh, he'll be able to share his experiences of, of working for me and my team. Uh, I'm sure it'll be all good. Um, and also the, the new one of these digital COVID products that I couldn't possibly talk about that definitely doesn't have anything to do with the politically sensitive and contentious topic of domestic use of COVID vaccine status certification for events, venues and other sectors. However, uh, I think I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to address some bigger ideas. Uh, and I'm going to use the notion of creating resilience in health and care to set out six areas of opportunity uh, and the things that we're working on in each area. This isn't the whole of our digital strategy, but it's certainly six key parts within it. Uh, and I think it allows us to get our eyes up to the horizon rather than spend our time focusing on COVID, which is always the temptation given the burden it continues to um, bring to society in Northern Ireland and in, in particular my sector, health and social care. Before I set out these six opportunities, I wanted to cover quickly the nature of the challenge that we're facing in health and social care as a sector today, um, which provides a little bit of context as to why the opportunity areas that I'll set out later are so important. Um, and this is the bit of my presentation where I recognize that everyone loves a good graph. Um, so I'm going to over deliver by, uh, by giving you six graphs, not one. Um, so I recognize that this slide is a, is a bit of an eye test. So I'm gonna walk through the, the bits of narrative that I wanted you guys to just hold in your minds. So figure one top left is population projections. So the proportion of our population uh, in Northern Ireland over the age of 65 is, is changing rapidly. In the eight years between 2015 and 2023, it's gonna change more than over the previous 40 years. And in just over 10 years, that population, the over 65s, is going to double what it was in 2000. The second graph deals with comorbidities or, or uh, chronic illnesses, multiple chronic illnesses. So by the age of 70, nearly 80% of us will have one or more chronic condition. And by the time we're 80, nearly 60% of us will have three or more comorbidities or chronic conditions. On the top right there, I'll bring in the, the, the dirty topic of money, uh, the age cost curve. So in terms of costs, citizens aged over 65 account for more than two fifths of health and social care spending in any health economy and certainly in Northern Ireland, uh, compared to their population share of 14%. So it's 42% compared to 14% of population share. And whereas the average cost of treating a 55 to 59 year old 
per year stands at just under £2,000 per head. This rises to over £6,000, more than triples for 75 to 79 year olds, and is £14,000 a year for the over 85s, more than 7x. So moving then to the bottom left of my charts here about deprivation and life expectancy. So while overall in Northern Ireland, people are living longer and healthier lives, health inequalities continue to be a major issue for us. Life expectancy for males in the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland is on average seven and a half years less than their counterparts in the least deprived areas. Thinking then about capacity and services in the centre at the bottom there, consultation rates, figure five. Demand is increasing and expectations are changing. Currently in Northern Ireland, 60% of people are overweight or obese. Uh, almost 20% of adults in Northern Ireland show some signs of a mental illness uh, and over 10% of the population claim disability living allowance. Over the period 2009 to 2014, the demand for access to GP surgeries increased on average by 21.5%. In 2013, 12.4 million consultations were undertaken. This equates to an average of just under seven consultations per patient per year in Northern Ireland, which is really at the high end of the spectrum compared to other OECD countries. In the Republic of Ireland, as a comparator, the figure is three consultations per patient per year. And finally, on waiting times, uh, and I think this is evident to all of us, the number of outpatient appointments increased by almost 120,000 between uh, 2011 and 2014. The number of inpatient and day case admissions increased by almost 50,000 over the same period. So demand on services is increasing. So in, in that quite bleak context then, I wanted to just talk through six things uh, that we can do uh, and a little bit of, of what we are doing in response to, to that contextual situation. Um, and these are opportunities to become more sustainable and resilient in keeping with the theme of the presentation here. So firstly, uh, we need to break the linear relationship between the demand for services and our capacity to meet that demand to deliver those services. Uh, and I'm going to use COVID as a little bit of a, a case study here. So citizens were galvanised into action during the pandemic. Uh, and I'm going to put that into some numbers just real quick. So there were 180,000 downloads of the COVID Care NI app, which is the symptom checker and advice and guidance smartphone app and website that we put together. There were 625,000 downloads of the Stop COVID NI app, which was the digital proximity app uh, to avoid uh, people unknowingly being in uh, positions of risk in terms of folks that they were close to uh, either on the bus or, or in going about their daily lives. 4.6 million COVID test results were processed in the test registry and 160,000 SMS messages were sent to close contacts. 48,000 uh, close contacts uh, cases were traced on the new digital self trace service. Over a million and a half separate users have accessed the COVID dashboard with over 50,000 hits a month on that service. There's 370,000 hits so far on the vaccines dashboard. Uh, 1.4 million unique and completed online bookings for attendance at vaccination appointments. Uh, and 200,000 uh, digital COVID vaccine certificates for international travel have been downloaded. It's increasingly evident that citizens want to be more empowered and active partners in their healthcare journey, and a majority of them are happy to do this digitally. Digital tools have the potential to increase self-service where it's relevant to do, uh, and when done right, it improves citizen experience and convenience as well as efficiency. Digital can provide patients, clients and their carers with greater visibility and control over treatment and care pathways. And crucially, this piece of the jigsaw puzzle can break that currently linear relationship between demand and capacity. People want to be able to view their healthcare records, order repeat prescriptions digitally and maybe undertake some aspects of triage in order to get expedited access to services. All of this is possible. Uh, all of this is used elsewhere in the UK and Northern Ireland is behind the curve uh, and this sets out a focus for our digital transformation over the coming years. My second point is that we need to shift towards more standardised and evidence-based care across Northern Ireland's health and care provider organisations, putting safety and quality at the heart of all new processes and systems. Um, we have in Northern Ireland a, a portfolio of about 70 projects and programs that we're delivering in the health and care domain. 
Uh, and I've mentioned just four of them on this slide within the major programs portfolio. Uh, and that sets out a little bit of what we're doing in response to this point about creating once for Northern Ireland pathways and services. And while the technology bits of this are hard, uh, we should recognize that the really hard bit is the clinical transformation uh, to achieve the standardized processes. So the four that I've mentioned on this slide are the digital identity service, which is a replacement of the canonical electronic master patient index uh, with a master data management application that allows us to have more flexible centralization of control for how we interact with citizens based on a, on a new digital identity for the future. The, the Northern Ireland PAX uh, is the system that we're putting in place and refreshing at the moment to provide ubiquitous access to the same platform for storing, recording and conveying digital imaging from X-rays, CTs, MRs and other imaging disciplines. NIPIMS is the, the, the equivalent project that we're putting in place to standardize how we do pathology services, which has been something that we've all interacted with during the course of the pandemic, uh, given that we've been doing these COVID tests. So the, the, the uh, pathology systems are going to be standardized and rolled out across Northern Ireland. And finally, the, the flagship transformation program that we're doing to implement a new electronic medical record from the American vendor called EPIC is our Encompass program that will truly transform how we deliver care services. Um, my uh, third point then um, is that we need to get better at joining up services and information across the sector and protecting the information as we use it. Um, there's, a, there's a great big long list because this is a pretty broad church, this point, uh, that I could have put up on this slide. But I think four things are quite interesting for us to consider together today um, are ontology, integration, cybersecurity and information governance. So the, the ontology point is how you create standardized ways of describing, codifying the care that we give, the illnesses, uh, that our citizens experience um, and the procedures that we apply in the way that we deliver end-to-end -end care. Integration, obviously, it's been known about in the IT industry for years that, that being able to connect together data once you've delivered a, a common ontology across different organizations and systems is uh, one of the key challenges in creating joined up public services. Um, the, the health and care sector recognize that. Uh, the Encompass program I, I, I mentioned a moment ago is, is one of the ways that you can solve that problem by putting a, a single application across multiple different settings. Uh, but it doesn't make the integration problem go away. And we're focused on the investments that we need to make to be able to connect systems and data together better. Cybersecurity, big issue. I'm sure you're hearing a lot about it today. Uh, I won't dwell on the point, but the, the nature of the changing threat landscape that surrounds health and social care provider organizations as evidenced by successful cyber attacks on a number of different key constituents in the health and social care uh, partner ecosystem recently, Queen's University being one, uh, the HSC in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, it shows us that we need to increase our focus and investments on securing and protecting our information systems and data. And finally, information governance. It's been so important during in COVID to, to be able to move quickly to deliver new systems and information governance often is an inhibitor to that. And we need to develop our skills such that it plays the role that it's supposed to, to protect the privacy and integrity of data rather than acting as an obstacle for transformation. My fourth point then um, is uh, about our staff. So we need to support our staff to do their work more easily, efficiently, and collaboratively within multidisciplinary and multi-organization teams. Um, as a technologist, we've known that this is a journey that we needed to take to create mobile, flexible tools to support our staff to do their best work every day. Um, when Boris made the announcement last March that everybody who could needed to work from home, he flipped a switch that made the demand for that transformation happen overnight that would have taken us technologists years to achieve. The programs that we're delivering in Northern Ireland Health and Care to try and drive that journey um, they, they are many and varied. Three examples here are the digital workplace program to, to relicense how we use productivity and collaboration technologies and deliver a more consistent identity management for staff, uh, a single collaboration tool set with a single set of configurations to allow people to connect together and uh, across organizations and organizational boundaries and how you create single communications mechanisms like email for use across health and care. The equip program is the replacement of all of our back office systems. So finance, procurement, logistics, HR, all of those become world-class leading application 
uh, application estates to support the delivery of business capability to make uh, make our staff's lives easier. And finally, HSC Digital is the creation of a single shared service. So we have one way of delivering technology support to staff across the whole sector and one way of delivering data center services, network services, cloud, all of the, the SIAM towers that you would expect us to be playing around with here. My fifth point is one about um, insight and information. And, and as we heard in the introduction, it's been a theme for today. We need to use data much better, understanding our population and their needs and connecting and using information to create insights and improvements. And in order to do this, we're in the process of creating a new health and social care information strategy, which is very likely to point to the need for a new health and social care information institute. And that institute will seek to do the five things that you guys can see on screen here today. In education and evangelism, we're going to embed the term data across our organizations and in our society, helping everyone to understand the importance of maintaining quality data sets and evidencing the positive impact that analytics and data science and insights can bring to service development. We're going to do training and skills development to support our people to be confident in using data uh, and to deliver skills development programs across the sector uh, and establish career pathways for staff that nurture critical data and informatics capabilities. On data platforms, we're going to design and implement the platforms that are accessible and easy to use across the whole of health and social care, systems and platforms that generate quality insights and embed new and exciting technologies such as AI and cognitive computing. On analytics and insights, we're going to build capabilities and frameworks that harness the power of all of this data that we're collecting, providing quality, actionable insights for staff to make decisions. Uh, we're going to have to share data to enable collective awareness and decision making, uh, and that's a big step forward for our service. And then finally, my point repeated on information governance and legals, good governance is fundamental to safety, quality and innovation. We must implement and maintain a robust data governance process that builds those standards and enables us to work uh, and implement new legislation for secondary uses. And um, my final of my six points here is about um, innovation. So working better with the innovation ecosystem within and outside health and social care to create real impact at scale from innovations uh, and advancements in research and emerging technologies. So health and care as a sector is built on innovation. The scientific method is integral to the psyche of all of our doctors and health and social care professionals. However, the reality is that despite all of the amazing innovation that happens across health and care every day, not much of it has an impact at scale on the bottom line of economic sustainability of health and care. Here in Northern Ireland, we've got the highest um, age adjusted per capita cost in the UK and among the worst waiting lists for elective and day case services in Europe. So what are we gonna do? How do we develop a new innovation strategy that has that bigger impact and alignment between innovation and the big problems that we face as a service? So we're gonna develop um, this new strategy that has within it four components, a new digital innovation pathway that assesses technology readiness levels to determine which technologies and initiatives are ready to scale, a digital innovation infrastructure to facilitate scale up and spread of those successful innovations, uh, an innovation support hub to promote and optimize the use of digital and data to support innovation, and a new governance structure that helps to align innovation to executive level initiatives and stakeholders. So those are my six points that I've I've counted through really quickly for you here. I'll pop them on screen um, just so you can you can see the the six opportunities to create better quality, more sustainable and resilient health and care services where digital has a big part to play. And in closing, uh, and before we hit the, the Q&A section here today, I just wanted to say a big thanks for your time. Um, and if any of you out there are interested um, in finding out more about opportunities to come and help us on this journey, then do feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. Thanks a lot. Time I, I have a presentation put in front of me, I do find it fascinating. And I, I think that that shows the dynamism uh, on which you're handling the, the main and many challenges uh, I, I think, uh, from my perspective, that information governance uh, issue uh, and some of the, the six bits and pieces, I wrote the whole series of things down here, 
uh, and breaking the linear relationship of need and the ability to respond was 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 really a key element right up front. Was we can't go on the same way we're we're doing it at the moment because it just is not sustainable in terms of the future. And I'm one of them, so I get into that top end category uh, where ultimately, yes, I will be costing the system a lot more money than somebody else. So I've got a question here, first of all, from my perspective, and I'd, I'd like uh, all of the panel to have a quick go at this. Uh, how important do you think it is to engage with our younger constituency with digital innovation to meet their expectations not just to drive what we need to, to, to happen but to meet their expectations we saw it from lisa's presentation on on the, the 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 or sorry stephanie's presentation on the great work of vr but you know how important is it that we engage with our younger constituency to make sure that they're uh, gaining uh, benefit from what we're doing uh, who would like to start that off? Catherine. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about that from, is my microphone on? Oh, it yeah, is. I'm thinking about that from a whole, um, from a number of different perspectives. Um, one is, I think, when you look at the people you serve as a public body, you need to be aware of your segmentation um, of, of that group. Um, and that's why when I talked in my presentation about using data analytics. I think it's really important for us, for example, we have been able to analyze our tenants and the groups that live within households for exactly that reason, and um, particularly during COVID, so that we could see how many young people were in the households, was there an ability in that household um, to, for us to engage? Could we engage um, with younger people so that they could actually help with maybe older people um, in the same household? Um, so I think knowing who you're trying to engage with and finding every possible way you can to engage, particularly with younger people, is really important. When I think about that from the other side as well, one of the, my biggest message, I think, coming out of my presentation was how important your people are in being able to achieve anything that you want to achieve and, and um, being ambitious as an organisation. Um, engaging, again, with younger people to bring them into your organisation is really really important and um again using every single means at your disposal to do that um i think how we um how we even um advertise posts and seek new talent and bring new talent into the organization we need to think about we need to think about once they're in the organization what are the things that we can do to keep them there to engage um, to get people excited about what they're doing, what you're doing as an organisation, and what they're doing as a contribution to that, I think there's there's so many levels on which we need to engage um, with younger people to make sure that we we can actually, I suppose, harness the power of what we're trying to do and get the benefit from it. Good. And 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 Catherine, you mentioned the word social there, and Dan, you added social into your title. How far do you see the health service in Northern Ireland being able to benefit by engaging with young people within that strategy to help with the social care aspects? Uh, or, as, as Catherine says, get on to the ladder of becoming a health professional, be their nurse or an OT or an, a physio, et cetera, in our, in our system, because obviously skills and competencies sit there right in the core of, of, of how you deliver health care. I've got a, a few thoughts in here, um, and I'm going to jump around a little bit in topics. So po apologies for that. I think it's um, it's important to recognise that a lot of the cost in in health and social care as a sector is driven by social determinants that aren't under the control of of the Department of Health or or health and care as a domain. The the biggest impact that we had on health and care outcomes almost historically was the availability of warm, dry housing for the population. Uh, that's, that's got nothing to do with healthcare. It's, it's a social determinant that manifests in demand for health and social care services. I, I think habits form young. Uh, and I think when it comes to lifestyle diseases, uh, if we can get to younger people and influence them, then I think we have a big opportunity to, to really turn the dial, generationally speaking, in sustainability and resilience of health and care services. Um, it's, it's quite cliched, I think, 
now to say that that younger people live in a digital world. Um, I think in my experiences during COVID, actually through all age groups, people want to interact with public services digitally now. I don't think it's just younger people. Uh, and we, we saw that in some of the numbers that I um, had posed during my presentation. I think in the way that you interact with younger people though, um, it, you inevitably end up being a bit patronizing or certainly that's what I've experienced in you know public health initiatives to try and address younger people it ends up being being inauthentic in the way that you you try and communicate your messages and I, I think we need to learn not to reinvent the wheel right the the uh, marketing sector are absolutely brilliant at talking to younger people and they've learned how to do that with an authentic voice without being patronizing. Uh, you know, young people are now a big part of the economy uh, and they are they are consumers uh, and, and they are fiercely selective in how they consume content and how they spend their money. Uh, and I think during COVID, we tried to learn from that, particularly when we were putting out some of the digital apps. The, the Stop COVID app was made available to post-primary kids for the first time uh, globally. Actually, Northern Ireland was a first in overcoming some of the information governance implications of deploying uh, a exposure notification smartphone app to, to younger people. Uh, and we just watched what the, the commercial sector did in, in conveying messages to younger people. And we went to the platforms that they live on uh, and tried to maintain an authentic voice that they were willing to, to engage with and listen to. And I think there's a lot for us to learn from that in the way that we configure and convey public services in the future. Right, thanks very much. I'm not gonna uh, ask the other two panel members. I think they talked uh, uh, about that in their presentations. Uh, I, one final one for Catherine before we end up and a, a, a short an answer so we can go to coffee. Uh, how do you evaluate which digital services are here to stay and which only have increased activity by necessity over the last 18 months or so? Um, I suppose that's through in the level of engagement. Um, that's why it's really important for us to measure the outcomes of what we do. And we put a lot of emphasis on that. We put a lot of emphasis on measuring engagement, measuring outcomes, um, assessing the difference that, it, that what we have done has made. And that's both in a qualitative and quantitative way. Um, so I think you need to be prepared uh, to assess what you do, look at the things that have worked and look at what haven't worked and change that. And I think that's one of the things that really COVID has taught us is that don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid to try new things. If they work, that's great, but measure whether or not they have worked. And if they haven't, then do something different. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers. Uh, Dan, thanks very much for coming on uh, online again. I know you're exceptionally busy, uh, so farewell. And thank you very much. Uh, in